So today I'm very excited and very, very thankful to Dr. Landau for agreeing to be our keynote speaker for HCC's Earth Day celebration. Despite the pandemic that we're in, it is a special one because it marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Dr. Landau has, been, has a Bachelor of Science in International Environmental Studies from Rutgers University, a Master's of Science in Entomology and Plant Pathology from the University of Tennessee, and a PhD in Entomology and Plant Biology from Louisiana State University. Since 2001, Dr. Landau has been the ecologist for the Nature Conservancy, the Maryland DC chapter, with a focus on ecological restoration and Dr. Lando is going to be talking to us today, entitled Planting, Pulling, Fire, and Water. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Lando. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I sure wish I could be there in person. Um, I'm ha so happy to do this, but very sad that it's remote. Um, so yes, the introduction was perfect. I'm the ecologist for the Maryland DC chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And the focus of my work is ecological restoration. So mostly what I do is work on our preserves in Maryland and try to restore them either to their historical composition, so looking backwards, or increasingly looking forwards to, towards trying to ensure that these habitats are healthy and resilient in light of changing conditions. Um, the Nature Conservancy works in 72 different countries um, throughout the world. We have chapters in all 50 states and um, programs in almost every country in the Americas. And we also have some programs in Africa, Asia, and Australia. The mission of the Nature Conservancy is to preserve the plants, animals, and natural communities that represent the diversity of life on Earth by protecting the lands and the waters that they need to survive. Historically, we were a land trust. We were actually the world's biggest land trust, so we would buy land and protect it. But increasingly, we've really had to diversify. Uh, it's clear that you can't just buy land and sit at the side and hope for the best. So we are working more in government relations and policy uh, with climate change, trying to mitigate climate change, reduce it, and, and deal with the effects. This is how I see the world. Um, I work throughout Maryland, and we have some 30 preserves throughout the state. Most of them are either in western Maryland, so they're kind of on the extremes. Uh, we have a lot in on the eastern shore of Maryland, and then some in southern Maryland and sprinkled throughout. I think the closest to Hagerstown is our little Catoctin Highland Glades Preserve. So happy day before Earth Day. Um, a lot has changed in the past 50 years. In 1970, when we had our first Earth Day, the world population was 3.6 billion people. Now, 50 years later, the world population has more than doubled to 7.8 billion. Um, I love this. Geologists call our period in time the Anthropocene, meaning that human activity has the most influence on our climate and the environment than anything else. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about that. Um, one thing that defines the Anthropocene is, this is not great, but it's a layer of plastic throughout the entire planet. Uh, you can look for other geologic periods, the Holocene or the Pleistocene or what have you, for often there are um, markers that you can look at in traces in the rock or in the soil that tells you that this is the period you're looking at. So if we were to stop plastic production today and go forward a millennia, say a thousand years from today, there would be a thin layer of plastic coating the entire Earth, um, defining the Anthropocene. So when Earth Day was first created in 1970, it was a really exciting time. It rode on the coattails of a decade filled with social activism. Voting rights had recently been strengthened. Civil rights were starting to be outlined, uh, and women were demanding equal treatment. There was no Environmental Protection Agency, no Clean Air Act, no Clean Water Act. So Earth Day 2020, exists in a world with more of a regulatory framework to enact environmental policy and regulate our impact. We have a lot more regulation, more rules in place today. Um, 
ironically, at this very moment, we're rolling back a lot of those Clean Air Act <laughs> regulations, but I'm hoping this is just a blip in time and that we'll continue to make forward progress soon. Um, but there's lots of good news. Um, Although the world's population has more than doubled since the last Earth Day, our streams are cleaner than they were 50 years ago. The Chesapeake Bay is healthier today than it was in 1970, which is really amazing. Maryland, along with the other five Chesapeake Bay watershed states and the District of Columbia, has implemented plans to remove the bay from the National Dirty Waters List by 2025. It's called the Chesapeake clean water blueprint and it's really really working so it's really exciting to see so much amazing progress but moving forward the two most pressing is pressing issues that we face are habitat loss and climate change and these two issues are really closely interrelated so as I mentioned earlier um, the Nature Conservancy we're really good at buying land and set it, setting it aside and preserving it but that's just no longer enough. Um, with climate change, things are moving, the stage is changing. So we really need to look at everything comprehensively in order to effectively protect our environment. And we have new challenges that we never would have thought of back in 1970. One that a lot of people are talking about today is the abundance crisis. Um, so two quick definitions. There's species diversity and there's species abundance. So diversity is the number of species, so how many different species you might have. Whereas abundance is individuals, kind of mass, how many actual organisms you have of a number. And both of these are changing, but the abundance is almost as alarming as the species lost. So for native species, biomass, so the actual amount of little bodies and organisms is down 20% since 1900. And then if you do look at species for amphibians, 30% of amphibians worldwide are now uh, considered threatened or endangered. Butterflies, abundance is down 35% over the past 40 years. That's just an astronomical amount. And in North America, bird abundance is down almost 30% or 3 billion birds since the last, <clears throat> the first Earth Day. Um, the table on the right shows this graphically. Interestingly, wetland birds are up. And that's thanks to some really effective adaptive harvest management and billions and billions of dollars put into wetland protection and restoration. But that's the anomaly. For the most part, in all these other habitats, species, uh, abundance numbers are declining for birds. So how do we figure out where to work and where our, um, our actions can be most effective? I really like this uh, illustration, uh, which really shows the importance of how everything is connected. Um, and it's really mesmerizing because I just like to look at it. So what this shows is this is a model of estimated movement for three areas for uh, mammals, birds, and amphibians. And it's showing with climate change, with warming temperatures, and looking at geology and geography where species are going to go. And what I really, what, what, what catches my eyes every time is right here. This is the Appalachian Mountains and it's like a super highway of species just, it's just funneling straight up the Appalachian Mountains. And this is for a number of reasons. With increasing temperatures, yes, species will move north, but they also need topographic variation. They need to be able to move up where it's also cooler and has more varying um, climate. So the Appalachian Mountains have that, but they're also relatively green still. There's movement. There's um, a lot of unfragmented forest, which allows species to move forward. So if you're sitting saying, I wonder where I could have the most conservation impact if I were to work in an area. To me, this just screams Appalachian Mountains. So models like this are really, really helpful. So what are we doing about the changing climate and how are we continuing to manage our lands? Well, one of the things that we're trying out 
today is assisted migration. And that's essentially, we know that species are going to move north. That's established as things warm up. But some things like trees, obviously, are going to move really, really slowly. And it's, um, there are concerns that they won't be able to move fast enough before their habitat disappears. So what we're trying in on the preserve on the eastern shore of Maryland is bringing up some longleaf pine trees, which is a more southerly tree. This is a tree that you would find anywhere from Florida to Virginia. And they create these really interesting, really important habitats um, throughout the coastal plain. So what we've done is we've planted several thousand, these are some young longleaf pine seedlings um, on this preserve, and we're seeing how they do, how they, um, how they fare here in Maryland. And there's a number of different things here. First, we're learning about the trees and how to manage them, but we're also starting to create this habitat so that it is, if it is lost further south, will already kind of have a starter forest. These are slow growing trees. They can take 50 to 100 years to mature. So we're kind of getting ahead of the curve. And one of the reasons we pick longleaf pine trees is they're really well adapted to extremes. They do very well with high temperatures. They do well with long periods of drought and with long periods of intense rainfall. And they have a really long taproot so they can withstand temp uh, weather extremes like hurricanes and it's predicted that we're going to have far more hurricanes moving forward as the Gulf um, as the Gulf warms up. So, and if you look at trends, um, this is in Salisbury, which is near where we have planted these trees. Sure enough, temperature wise, there's a very definite trend from 1950s to today in temperature. Um, and there's also a similar trend, not quite as obvious, but in precipitation. Um, this little graph actually shows these temperature extremes that were, uh, sorry, precipitation extremes. We, it's estimated that we're going to have more uh, extreme drought periods and more extreme wet periods. But all in all, we're getting hotter and we're getting wetter. So this is one of the ways that we're <clears throat> trying to, to see what we can do kind of to get ahead. But we also are trying to um, protect these areas as close as we can to what they were historically. And when I say historically, I mean before European colonization. But we'll never know what um, Maryland looked like when Captain John Smith first arrived 400 years ago on the Eastern Shore. Um, we don't even know what he looked like. We've got some artist interpretations and we've got the Disney version. But we do have a pretty good idea of what he saw based on his records. He took really good notes. So there's a number of different things we can look at. He has records of witness trees, which is when um, they were mapping out areas or planning out property lines. They would find the corner trees and write down the species of trees. So if it was a white oak or a pitch pine, that was recorded. So we have records of hundreds and hundreds of different species of trees. That starts to give us an idea of what was there when they first arrived. Um, and he has journal entries where he described uh, what the forests look like. He describes big trees um, and vast open areas with forests that were so open that you could drive a horse-drawn carriage through them. So we have really good descriptions of what it looked like when he was there and what was going on. Um, he has descriptions of Native Americans setting fire to the area. So we do have some inkling of what it looked like historically. But obviously, we've really changed what um, what John Smith would first have encountered. Um, and there's so many different things we've done. We've, we have farms or pine plantations. On the eastern shore, many, many forests were cut down and planted with rows and rows and rows of pines, um, kind of like corn. And underneath, it's just nothing can grow in these plantations. We've ditched everywhere. We really like it dry. Um, so we've gotten really, really good at moving water off the land, uh, particularly wetlands, very quickly. We have invasive species, plants, animals, all sorts of organisms that have really disrupted many natural systems. 
And we have things like mill ponds, which are really interesting. These are areas where uh, early settlers, colonists, would have um, dammed up waterways to put in mills, grist mills for corn or wheat or, or for timber. And these have created some really interesting little wetlands. Um, fire suppression. About 75 years ago, we almost entirely stopped natural fires and we did a really good job of it. And that has drastically changed the composition of the majority of our forests because historically they would have burned naturally. And of course, development. We live here. We have homes, we have shopping malls, so we put in so much impervious surface and this has just altered our environment forever. So what is it that we're working towards? Again, what's a natural system. Um, so when most of us go for a hike in the woods, this is maybe what you're going to see. This, this to me is a typical modern forest. It's kind of dark. It's got lots and lots of trees. Uh, they're pretty close together, pretty shaded. Um, not a lot under the trees. The herbaceous understory is what I call that. You might have 20 to 40 species of a couple of shrubs and some little grassy things, but a whole lot of trees, over 300 trees per acre. But a lot of accounts suggest that this is really what our forests should look like. Herbaceous diversity would be way higher, 100 to 150 species per acre of grasses and sedges and uh, shrubs, and way fewer trees, maybe 40 to 75 trees per acre. And this is more of what Captain John Smith described when he first arrived in Maryland, these wide open spaces. And I could almost see a horse-drawn carriage going through this forest. So what's happened? How did we get from this wide open space to this dark, dense, closed in forest? And how do we go back? Well, a lot of people think that what's missing here is fire. Again, historically, many areas in Maryland and throughout North America used to burn on a regular basis. Whether it was lightning, so naturally caused, or Native Americans. Native Americans had a pretty heavy hand on their environment and they would very regularly uh, set fire to the land either for game to make it easier to hunt or after the fire swept through to attract game because of all the, the regrowth. To keep it open they had a really good understanding that fire reduced tick populations. Um, so for many many different reasons Native Americans used to use fire and that had a real um, effect on their environment. And we know that the majority of the Earth's ecosystems are fire adapted and if you look at all of North America it's actually considered fire dependent which means that the majority of our ecosystems need fire in order to continue, in order to thrive and to be resilient. And you can look at other things too so now let's focus back in on North America, you can use vegetation maps that can tell you what sort of fire frequency used to occur. And these are really, really rough, but essentially so for the lower shore of Maryland, based on the vegetation, we know that fires historically probably occurred anywhere from say uh, one to every 10 years, so fairly frequently, but maybe in parts of Western Maryland less frequently, as, as infrequently as every 34 years. But uh, some grasslands would have burned far more frequently. So this, looking at vegetation, you start to get a sense for not just whether or not there was fire, but how often that fire should have happened. And we can bring it down even further. So this is a study that we're currently doing in Western Maryland, in Frederick, in Washington counties where we're looking at fire scars to get a sense historically of how frequently fires were occurring in our areas. And we're doing this in Catoctin Mountain Park, uh, at Indian Springs Wildlife Management Area and at our Siling Hill Creek Preserve. Um, and fire scars are really interesting. Essentially what it is is if a fire moves through an area 
I might damage a tree and that tree is going to heal over. It'll fill up that, um, that damaged area with sap and grow over it. But then if there's another fire, say five years later or whatever, that little indentation, that injury is more likely to catch fire uh, because it's got sap and it's not smooth anymore. So it's going to burn again. And again, the tree will heal over. So fire after fire after fire, that tree from that first injury is going to keep recording each subsequent fire and we call that a recorder tree. So this is a recorder tree here and here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fires that were recorded in this one living tree. So what we can do is we can either take a sample of these trees or we there's plenty of them that have fallen and died and we can count the fire scars and we can age them so from these fire scar trees here's one that had uh, one two three four five burns all the way down back it fires this one recorded in 1814 so it can give us a really really good sense of when these how frequently these fires were occurring in our backyard as well as when they occurred, it's really cool based on whether it's in the light wood or the dark wood, you can know if it was dormant season or if it was growing season. And what we're finding is fires were happening pretty frequently in Catoctin about every five years, in Indian Springs about every seven years, and at Siling Hill about every eight years. So pretty close to that other map I showed you, which said maybe about every 10 years, but um, so, so neat stuff right here. We know that we had fire pretty frequently. And we still have to think through where we are burning and why we're burning and, um, and again, how often. So for some areas like um, we have some serpentine barrens, which are these open grasslands, we could burn them every other year because uh, they're mostly grasses and they recover very quickly. Uh, here in the central Appalachians, again, based on this information, we know that we probably want to be burning every five to eight years. Um, wetlands also surprisingly really need fire. A lot of the wetland vegetation um, requires fire in order to stay open. Um, and then pine plantations, even though it's not a natural system, many cases it's really beneficial to burn a pine plantation to burn off a lot of that uh, understory, those pine needles, and to allow some herbaceous vegetation to come in. So fire is a really valuable tool. It's just a matter of knowing where and when and how often to use it. Now I wanted to say a word or two about carbon emissions because um, much of my job is setting fires and people always say, what about carbon emissions? They're bad. Well, yes and no. So I like to call it good fire and bad fire. So good fire is what I call when we do a control burn and it's under literally really, really controlled circumstances. We will write a plan, which we call a prescription. And in the prescription, we have really carefully defined situations. There can't be too much wind. The humidity has to be just right. It can't be too dry. We define the area where we'll burn and we'll have either a road or a stream or we'll put in a line to make sure that the fire stays in this area. And when we do the burn, they're usually very quick, very light fires. So essentially they're burning off what we call fuel, all the dead branches, the thatchy grasses that have died, um, some smaller thin barked trees. And we end up with, um, with a clean open area. And what happens is really, really quickly, you get this amazing resurgence of growth. These grasses will come back in weeks and have this crazy green vibrancy to them. And the trees that remain will grow bigger faster. So you end up locking more carbon into the system after the first few months and couple years than you released with your initial burn as opposed to what I call a bad fire. And these are the mega fires that we're seeing out west and in uh, Australia most recently. These are not natural systems. These are fires that are resulting from 75 to 100 years of fire suppression. So fuels have built up year after year after year. 
and in addition the trees are growing much more densely together than they historically would have. So what happens is when you ultimately do have a fire, and there'll always be a fire, these fires are catastrophic and they're completely consuming the trees because they're so close together that they're crowning. So the tree is completely burnt and they're so hot that they're burning down to mineral soil. So they're actually consuming the organic matter. So this is a huge release of carbon emissions and it can take years and decades in order to rebuild those soils and to uh, grow those trees back. So there's different variations of fire. Not all fire is bad and frequent fire can be very, very good. So I'll move away from fire. That's my favorite topic. So I tend to dwell on it. Um, not all Nature Conservancy forests consist of natural forests and not all our trees are protected. A lot of preserves that we have purchased have come with loblolly pine plantations on them, particularly on the eastern shore. And as I mentioned earlier, um, these are not very ecologically rich systems. They're kind of monocultural deserts. There's a thick layer of pine needles. Very little can grow under these. And yeah, they're just planted in perfect rows. Loblolly pines are actually native to Maryland, just not like this. So often when we buy a preserve with a pine plantation, we will try to restore it. Um, and one of the first steps is to remove the plantations. Um, but it's tricky. So we go through lots of extra hoops to try to do it just right. And we have a lot of rules. So we're very careful about picking just the right logger. And once we found one, we require them to power wash their equipment before they bring it on site because invasive species seeds can be stuck on mud that comes in on vehicles and we really don't want that. Um, we make them avoid wet areas. Um, we make them avoid our flag trees. Well, flag these pathetic little trees and they're really, really good at avoiding it. He cut down this huge lolly pine and left my scraggly little seedling here. Um, the truth is, after some eye rolling sometimes, I often find the loggers really get what we're doing and embrace it and, and almost see it as a challenge. Um, we also try to get equipment that's relatively small and has really big tires to distribute the weight. And we ask them to try to minimize how many roads they put in or landing areas, which is kind of where they work and they'll delimb the trees and it often has a big impact. So we just try to minimize the footprint that we make when we cut down the loblolly trees. And again, much like with fire, we try to be smart about where we're doing what we're doing and how much and how intensely. So many upland pine stands, we'll just thin them. We'll just take every other tree out, say, <clears throat> and let those trees get bigger and eventually um, harvest them. But in some areas, we have a lot of areas where wetlands were drained and planted in plantations and those we really want to accelerate that restoration process so we might go in and completely clear cut those pines and I'll talk a little bit more about the wetland restoration and then we have some these sandy ridges or um, um, xeric dunes these are these huge sandy dunes that we have particularly on the eastern shore and they're really interesting environment they're almost like grasslands and those are areas that historically would have burned really frequently so again we'll probably take all of the pine trees out of there to restore it more quickly and you, and then some places we have these wonderful bottomland forests so even if pines were planted there <clears throat> we're not going to touch them it's just not worth the negative impact that we would have bringing equipment in and some really cool things can happen after just cutting out the, the, the pine plantation. So there's one site, the one I mentioned, the wetland, where we decided to clear cut. Uh, it was a wetland, pines had been planted, and the site had been drained. So we had some back-to-back -back drought years where it got dry enough that we were able to bring equipment into the wetland and take all of the pine trees out. And the results were awesome. We had seven white fringed orchids, which are state listed, and a handful of these wonderful yellow crested orchids. So it was really exciting that we took out the pine trees and these orchids came back. Well, the following year, we were able to come back in again to that same site and we burned it. 
and the results were spectacular. We had over 50 of the white fringed orchids, 20 of the yellow crested orchids, and three of these super rare, uh, they call them the Canby's bog orchid, these crosses between the white fringed and the yellow crested. And what is really, really cool here is that this super rare orchid here, this cross, hadn't been seen in Maryland for 18 years until we burned. And when we went back in the records, we found that 18 years previously, on the same site, there was a wildfire. And that's when the orchid appeared. So it's just crazy to think that there's a wildfire and this super rare orchid appears, no fire for 18 years, and it just blinks out. And then we burn and it just pops right back up. So it just really shows how fire adapted so many of these systems are and that they're almost just waiting there for the fire to come back, for the plants to come back. And don't ask me how these spores can hang around for 18 years. I've asked all these orchid experts and they're like, yeah, they do that. So, and lots of other cool stuff came back too after we burned. Um, not rushes and beak rushes, but they're not quite as exciting as the orchids. But point is, when you bring fire back to the system and light by removing the trees, in many cases, the vegetation will return on its own and the animals too. So I'm going to switch to a different kind of wetland now. These are Delmarva Bays, and we have one that we call Dorchester Pond. And Delmarva Bays are really, really interesting habitats. They occur on the upper shore of Maryland, so Caroline, Queen Anne's counties, and into Dorchester County. And these are seasonally filled wetlands. There are natural, almost lens of clay that it acts almost like a pond um, in the winter and fall when it fills with water. And then in the summer and spring, it dries up and is essentially like a grassland with really cool, rare species in it. But what's happened is many of these Delmarva Bays are filling up with trees. And there's a number of different reasons here. One, you guessed it is fire suppression. Historically, fires would have swept through these areas in the summer when they were full of grass, and it would burn up any uh, little tree species, seedlings coming up. But also, there's a lot of agriculture in this area on the shore, and the agriculture, the farms, are tapping into the shallow aquifers. The, um, so the water levels um, the groundwater doesn't recharge as much as it used to every year. So the ponds don't fill up quite as much in the winter, and that allows, uh, that combined with fire suppression, allows trees to become established. So many of these ponds are just filling up with trees. So when I first started, one of the first things I did was go in and say, well, I'm going to cut these trees down. So I had all of these work days with fabulous volunteers, and we started, we'd come in the fall or winter, because I figured we'd have less negative impact on the pond itself. And also, it's just easier to cut the trees down when there's no leaves on them. So here we are. You can see how dense. We're in the pond, but it's just full of these little trees. And we cut, 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 cut. Um, so here's a little opening that we made. And lo and behold, the next spring, they all just re-sprouted. So it was a total fail. What I learned when I sat and th thought about it and talked to people was that if you cut these hardwoods when they're dormant, they're just going to re-sprout because all of their energy is stored in their roots. And so it's very easy for them to just come right back. So then what we started doing is cutting the trees in the end of, at the end of summer when they finished putting all their energy into growth and before they started to lock that energy up into the roots. So when we cut at the right time of year, third week in September is my golden time for me for this. Uh, lo and behold, the trees actually died. And I don't want to use herbicide in these sites because they're so sensitive. And sure enough, uh, the grasses just started to come back beautifully on their own once we removed the trees. So here's an example. Uh, we did this work in uh, September of 2002. And by August of the following year, not only have the 
native grasses and sedges come back so beautifully, but the pond is starting to fill back up with water because there were fewer trees taking up the water. And you can see here, it's kind of hard to see, but this is how far I'd gotten. <laughs> so here there's still a ring of trees that needs to be completed and I've since taken them. But again, after we did all this work and the grasses became reestablished, we reintroduced fire and of course, the results were spectacular, and the native plants just came back bonkers, as well as so many really exciting rare species. And amphibians, too. We had some really cool uh, carpenter frogs came back, for example. Um, and here's just another slide of a different burn. So here we burned in, um, in April. So here's March with um, the grasses. And then we burn in April, and by June, they've just come right back. So really amazing how well these sites can recover if you bring back the systems and the processes. So now I'm going to move to Western Maryland. Um, this is our Cranesville Swamp Preserve, and it sits right on the, this is Garrett County here, and this is the Maryland-West Virginia line, and this is Preston County, West Virginia. Here it is. So, um, Red spruce are a really important conifer species that used to be found throughout western Maryland into West Virginia, into Virginia, and into Pennsylvania. And uh, at the turn of the last century, so late 1800s, early 1900s, there was some really devastating logging that went on in which all of the trees were removed. Um, and red spruce habitats are really interesting in that they grow um, pretty close together. So it's not that open forest I talked about earlier. And they have this really nice, thick, hummusy, peaty layer underneath. They're pretty moist. Um, and what happened is um, when they came and took all of the trees out, um, that let sunshine hit these PD layers and they dried up and they would use steam engines to pull out the logs. So what would happen, and they'd leave all the slash behind the tops of the trees and the branches. So that would all dry up, the peat would dry up, and then the steam engines would let these sparks go and they had a different kind of catastrophic fire that would burn for weeks and weeks and weeks as not only were the tops of the trees burning, but the PD layers were burning. And again, this burned all the way down to mineral soil. So we've had very, very little spruce regeneration since then because not only is there no seed source, but the, the soil itself is gone. So what we've been doing for almost 25 years now is we've been going to this um, power line right of way in the Monongahela National Forest where there's some nice remaining spruce stands and we pick these seedlings that are growing up. This is a gas pipeline right of way. So these trees are just going to get mowed down. So we collect as many as we can, thousands. We put them in little buckets and then the next day we go to our preserve and we plant them. And we always plant in April, which in Western Maryland can be anything. We've had snow, we've had rain, and we've had some really, really nice days. And over the past 20 three years, we've restored tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of red spruce seedlings throughout Garrett County. Um, and it's been really satisfying work. It's actually one of the saddest parts for me of this whole thing because I missed my tree plantings. Um, and by restoring these red spruce trees, we're doing so much more than just planting trees. We're restoring the habitat. Again, as I mentioned, we're rebuilding these spruce soils, which can actually be rebuilt in 80 years or so. So it's not an unimaginable time that it'll take to rebuild the soils. And red spruce soils can sequester more carbon than almost any other forest type. So by, again, we're planting trees, sequestering carbon with the trees, but we're also rebuilding soils, and that's just so important for the system. And we're bringing back habitat for lynx, for uh, Arctic hares, for um, 
for flying squirrels, for all sorts of organisms that have disappeared since the spruce left. So not just the trees, we're not looking at individual species, we're really restoring the whole system. So let's talk a little bit now about um, animals. Um, beaver, I love beaver, they're so cool, they're amazing engineers, but they aren't always in the right place at the right time now that humans have entered the equation. And this is in many different ways. Um, and so I've talked again and again about how we've altered the habitats um, or systems. And one way, I just talked about red spruce, we did a really good job logging many, much of our confer forest in Western Maryland, for example. So what's happened now is beaver have come in, and historically beaver would come in, dam up a waterway, create a wetland, live there for a few years, eat up all the <clears throat> hardwood trees that they like, all the alders and the maples and the gums, and then they'll run out and they're just left with conifers and they leave and start a new wetland. But what's happening now is they're not running out of their food source. So beaver can set up shop in an area and they can stay for years and years and years and years. So A, um, they're creating far larger wetlands than they would have historically and um, flooding areas for much longer periods of time. And also they're more likely to end up in somebody's Basement, flooding somebody's basement because there's more people around. So I'm going to give you an example of some things we've tried. So this is our Finzel Preserve and this is in Garrett County in Western Maryland and here's a beaver dam that set up shop. And the problem here is that we have large trees and there's only two places in Maryland that have large trees. That's Finzel Swamp and Cranesville Swamp. And the beavers were killing the large trees. They were flooding them out and we didn't want to kill the beaver. So we tried a number of different things. For years we tried just breaking up the dam and that was totally ineffective. They would just rebuild it. So I read that if you have an opening that's 40 feet or more, beaver won't dam it up. So we took out big sections of this road that had been put in which beaver were damming up and we put in bridge spans. And that worked for about 10 years and then the beaver decided, ah, eh, we can rebuild. So once again, the beaver started damming up the swamp. So finally, what we're doing today is we've created these beaver baffles, which are these big PVC pipes that we just put in under the dam so that the beaver can think they're, they're still, the dam is still in place. And as long as they don't hear the water flowing, they leave the baffles in place so we can have the beaver and we can still have water flow and we can still have our native habitat. So this is just to show you another example of how things have changed and we're trying to work with the animals and the trees and the organisms and the systems we have with as little negative impact as we can. Um, so now just that. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on invasives. We have a lot of invasive organisms that have moved up into the area. And this is just a natural result of our global world. Um, and one of these organisms is the hemlock woolly adelgid. This is a tiny, tiny little insect that came from Asia and it feeds on hemlock trees. And what it does is it makes this, these little waxy um, bundles, so nobody wants to eat them. And they, um, they essentially, sorry, my cat's trying to, um, they kill the trees. They, each tiny insect will tap into a little leaflet and they inject toxins and they're devastating hemlock trees throughout the east. Um, and the only way that you can really protect the trees is by injecting each individual tree with insecticide. So what we've done in a few preserves is uh, we've treated the trees with um, these pesticides that last about 10 years. So it's really just a band-aid. We're trying still to find maybe some biocontrol, some insects that come from Asia where the hemlock woolly adelgid lives, where it evolves, and introducing these insects into the environment, hoping that they'll control them. So far, it's only been moderately successful. And what happens if we just lose our hemlocks? You know, what 
what's the big deal? Well, a lot. Uh, and this is just one example, one tree. So if we lost the hemlock, which are actually a keystone species, there's so much that's going to go on. Hemlocks you tend to find near rivers. Uh, so without the hemlock trees, you'll have increased groundwater and surface water flow. So you're going to get more siltation into the creeks and rivers. Um, you'll have increased temperature fluctuations. Hemlocks keep waterways cool in the summer and, and warmer in the winter time. So um, you'll alter that ecology. Uh, we found that there's three times more brook trout under in streams under hemlocks. And invasive species will come in. Japanese stilt grass and tree of heaven, Ilanthus, will come and in many cases replace these native trees. So it's really important to try to keep these systems. Another awful invasive that you may have heard of is uh, the emerald ash borer. Um, and this is a fairly new pest. And unlike the hemlock, it can take years and years to kill the trees. This one can kill um, ash trees in just a couple of years. And they're just sweeping through the area. They've already essentially killed all our ash trees in Western Maryland. But on the eastern shore, they're just starting to arrive. So um, what we're doing here is trying to protect some little pockets of ash trees. Um, this is hard to see, but I'm trying to show you. These are the – so ash trees on the eastern shore often grow in wetlands. And these are almost like the mangroves of the eastern shore. And they act as nurseries for fish. So if we lose these trees, we're really going to alter this system. So what we're doing here is we're trying to protect some little pockets of trees. So we come in, you have to go in kayaks because these are wetlands, and we're injecting each tree uh, with, um, with pesticides. So we have this little tree IV that you hook in, and it's really time intensive. It can take uh, 15 to 45 minutes per tree. So all we can do is protect little pockets of trees until we find another solution, and hopefully here we'll find a biological control agent that can kill um, the pest. Um, one more conifer restoration story that I want to tell. This is the Atlantic white cedar tree, and this is a really spectacular tree that we used to have throughout the eastern, the coastal plain. It, this is hard to see, but in red is its historic range, and it's almost entirely gone. Um, these are great trees for, uh, for roofing tiles. They're very rock resistant. Um, lots of older homes on the eastern shore were made with Atlantic white cedar. These trees are gone mostly, though not for logging, but because we drained so many wetland habitats. So in this case, we've just lost the habitat of the tree. So again, many steps involved in restoration. Um, here, what we did is we had a loblight pine plantation, and this was an area that it was planted in a wetland. So we clear cut a section of the wetland, uh, of the loblight pines. We uh, plugged up the ditches. Um, and then we burned it. And now what we've been doing is every year, in cooperation with the National Aquarium, we've had local school kids growing Atlantic white cedars in their classrooms. And they come every spring, and they plant the, the trees. And that has been enormously successful and a really nice way to involve the local community with the school kids. So. It doesn't always go as planned. Um, so one thing with ecological restoration is you always have to prepare for the unexpected. In one area, I planted a riparian buffer um, in Washington County. And just a few months later, after planting 50,000 trees, the field flooded. And all of my tree tubes were at 45 degree angles. Ah. In another area, I was ready to clear cut a loblolly pine plantation from a stand that I thought was a really good one to restore. And lo and behold, the state zoologist said, well, you know, you've got a federally endangered tiger beetle there. So that kind of threw that out the window. So lots of things that you need to think about, but lots of things that you don't think about that are just going to happen. And of course, there's always invasive. So many areas that we've tried restoring where maybe we've remove lava lay pines. And invasive species have come in and taken over, such as Japanese honeysuckle. And deer mess everything up. There are so many more deer than there used to be historically, as I'm sure you all know. And they love natives because that's what they've evolved to eat. So lots of things that you need to balance. So now we're balancing removing the trees, removing the invasives, and harvesting the deer. 
but eventually if you can figure these things these things out and move forward with your ecological restoration, you still have so many questions that you need to think about. Where should you focus your work? What are you restoring to? Are you going from Loblolly Pine to upland mixed hardwood forests? What are you doing in the wetlands? If you uh, clear wetlands and you don't um, and you don't restore the hydrology, you might end up just with a maple and gum forest and um, Conifer forest, so much restoration to be done. So lots of questions to answer, um, lots of riddles to solve, but in the end, it can be very satisfying work. So that's all I've got, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lando, for taking the time to share with us the really important work that you're doing in restoring the whole entire system. <laughs> uh, I should also thank uh, Dr. Dove for introducing us 